but um, fast growing fields and uh, market need for degrees at scale. Uh, and then, you know, all sorts of marketing activity around that market research, such as, you know, social media, press, constant monitoring and whatnot. So every time we, we launch a program, we do something new because we learn from the previous one. So for cyber, for example, uh, we do a lot of um, media nurturing and we, we did, um, I think the one up at the top is, no, that's the, so one, one of these uh, examples were around how we used the, the launch of the cyber and created uh, media articles uh, with Inside Higher Ed and other outlets to, to help um, market the program. So that's one capability that didn't exist before but that we now have. Um, we spent quite a bit of time with business plans, but this is something now we are um, uh, we are fanatical about it. I mean, we really um, we made it a priority to look at our costs and improve our costs, uh, improve our efficiencies. But at the same time, if there are things that we forgot the first time around, um, just correct those mistakes. And we're not an RPM institution, by the way. So learning design across our platforms and programs is something that we became really good at. As I mentioned, um, when a uh, computer science program was launched, it was Udacity creating the, the course content and course activities. We now brought that to, uh, to our, our group and you know, all of the other online and distance programs are all produced by um, our team here uh, in-house. That was and also a contract. Hmm. Sorry, Akut. That was also a contract stipulation that we wanted them to help us learn, and so we put people beside their ID teams that are on Yakut's team now, so that we knew that in three years it'd be it'd be us, and we did that by contract. Yeah. So that was that was that was very intentional when that was done. So this was a strategic thing that Georgia Tech did um, from the get go. Like, you know, we are forming this partnership, but we are going to own, own this down the line. Uh, we also integrated the design and production team. That's something that we learned throughout the process. These two teams need to work really closely together. Otherwise, you know, design becomes one thing and production becomes uh, something down the line. And, you know, down the line becomes close to the deadlines and people are scrambling and, you know, they're pointing heads. These two teams are one team and um, they have the meetings with faculty, the, the kickoff meetings all together. So it's not the instructional designer calling the shots. This is a, a, a group of um, talented individuals uh, helping a course happen. Uh, we also learned a lot about learner differences and content variations. Uh, we have, in our programs, we have K through 12, all the way to um, post-graduation and, and non-credit. I'm going to say non-credit because I don't know what else to say. Nelson, you just said non-credit is a non-starter, yeah. but so we, we have uh, quite a bit of experience but... and understanding of the differences between um, these um, these um, learner types and, and content types. And uh, you name it, we, we have it. We have a lot of experience in, in all of these um, uh, technologies and platforms. There is someone on my, on my team who touches these, these uh, systems and platforms um, every day, so um, and that's that's a strength. Um, but we also would like to have a more simplified ecosystem. So, in our initial um, thinking of that, we knew that startups, as I mentioned before, may not exist. So we wanted to make sure we were covering our bases. But we also felt by playing in all three, as well as Novo Ed, uh, that you also see up there in Canvas Net and Sakai and Moodle. It, the list goes on, as you well know. We could learn the fastest by getting our teams together, working in perhaps one or two and sharing information across the, the IDs so that we had that in-house expertise that we believe nobody else has because nobody works in all of them. Now we're starting to pare it down to a smaller list so that we can invest in other things such as personalized learning and, and those other kinds of newer systems that are starting yes. to grow up. Yes, exactly. And then there's, there's something to be said about institutional readiness and, and, and partnerships to make these things happen. And, you know, Nelson emphasized this. It takes a village. Um, this is not just about instructional design or course development. This is not about technology. This, is, this, is a lot, this has got a lot to do with marketing teams, finance teams, not only in our internal unit, but across the campus, learner services. Um, I think there was a lot of th there were a lot of things that we learned from the computer science experience with analytics and cyber. We 
placed a lot of emphasis on those partnerships across campus, brought those people to the table uh, very early on to, to make sure that we do in include uh, expenses on the, say, admissions side uh, in the, in the um, budget and uh, in the planning. And again, you know, among all these relationships and um, partnerships or the work that needs to be done, which one of the, those are strategic? And even though you outsource it or you let somebody else do it, you know, is it something that you want to own down the line? And you know, by the same token, what is it that you need to keep close to your chest and not outsource? And these, these questions need to be answered in the context of each institution or the system. And you know, our answers may not be your answers, um, but those are the, the things that uh, took place in our conversations. And as I mentioned throughout, uh, we do share our story in our Affordable Degrees at Scale Symposium, most recently in October. We are going to have another one uh, sometime this year, and we will make sure to let you all know when that happens. Uh, in the context of that symposium or outside, um, the, the invitation is still there. I repeat, if you want to come down, visit us, please do so. If you want your teams to talk to our teams um, using technology, we can make that happen too. Anything we can do to help out, because every time we talk to you all, we also learn from your questions, from your insights. So um, I think this is the last slide. Um, Nelson, would you like to t uh, talk about this one? Because I think um, this is your vision for all of us, and I would love you to um, bring it to closure. Yeah, no, no happy to, and, and thank you for your participation in this also. I know not being able to see the eyes of those in the room is a challenge. Uh, you, you did remarkably well. I tried to play your eyes on occasion, uh, and, and certainly we can debrief when I get back. Uh, but as I said several different times, one of the challenges I think we have in higher ed is that we think we know most of what there is to know, and everybody should listen to us. But as I espouse to industry to upscale their workforce, how do we as a university do that? We have lots of individuals in our universities that have been doing phenomenal work over the years. But things are changing around them too. What are our plans for our own staff development, our faculty development, and our student development in terms of new models and new things? So in parallel to this uh, creating the next in education, the report that came out from the provost office uh, is lagging behind it a, a similar activity in terms of what's our workforce of the future. Where will we work? What will we work on? How will we work? Who needs to be at the table? Uh, I mentioned I have employees now that are not in Atlanta or Savannah, where I have my other campus, but are on the West Coast and, and whatnot. What's that mean for a distributed workforce? How does the state actually do, you know, compensation of workers and pay on insurance benefits and all those kind of things in other states as a state entity? Uh, there, there, there's some interesting conversations that take place around all these, but we need to find ways to make it work. The most important part here is that the people that work for us have the same concerns that I hear when I go out to companies, and it's I want a future. And when I look inside my own organization and the layers at a university, we just had an outside consultant come in and say that we had 11 layers in the university from the president to the lowest level. If I asked most of the folks and most teams across our institute about career progression, and I said there was 11 to the president's desk, they'd say that was woefully inadequate because how do I advance my career? Yet the consultant came back and said we had too many. How do we find these career progressions for our own teams and think about the structures and ecosystems to allow our own teams to grow and take on experience and to have a career? It's not just a job. And I think if we can figure that out, and give them opportunities through our own programs that we're creating that maybe we'll find a way to also help the retention issue. And yes, I probably can't compete with the 2x salary bumps that, that they'll get from corporate right around me. But if I can find ways to value them and help them grow and to know that they're part of a, a viable ecosystem for the, their lifetime, uh, the pink slips, because I was there, come much quicker in corporate uh, as well. So there's some plus sides and downsides. Uh, and sometimes you have to experience those things to, to learn life lessons, just like you know your, your children when they see their hand going for the stove. Um, sometimes they'll listen and sometimes they don't. Uh, but this is, I think, an important also aspect of our university culture of how do we help ourselves through this new era of change. And change is not easy. 
for many of us. Uh, and it can be frightening at times. Will I have a job? One of the transformations we did was called Library Next, and we outsourced all of the books in a shared repository with Emory University to save cost and repurpose the entire library building to make it a learning space. What happened to all the librarians? Unfortunately, we didn't do a good job, my opinion, in terms of helping repurpose as many as we could. Um, there's other fields that all of us in this room can look at and say they're vulnerable in terms of our ecosystem. Who's helping think them through the next part of their career journey? And why don't we make that a priority? Next slide, Yakut, I think is the reflection side. Yeah, so let, let's skip this one, even though it's there, and go to the, the one about the action plan, because I know we're also bumping up on time here. So we'll certainly take questions, and we're kind of going to do this collaboratively together in terms of the action plan uh, and questions. There's a sheet on your table. There was the link uh, that's also down here at the bottom. We wanted you to have the opportunity to reflect on what you've heard, not just today, but likely uh, the, this whole event. Uh, 20 years of an event like this, quite an accomplishment, so congratulations uh, to be able to be able to do those kinds of things and to have these kinds of conversations. Uh, but we, we put some things down here, again, from our perspective. They may apply to you, they may not apply to you. Uh, but what is it that, that may take place uh, in here in terms of assets and expertise that you already have? Either as an institution, as a collection of institutions, as a system, where do those kinds of things reside and how do you know they reside? Uh, often inside my own institution, I'll find things out, and I've been there, as I said earlier, 30 plus years, and I'm still learning things that are at our institution. I had no idea where our institution. Uh, so sometimes our own trouble is knowing what's there and not trying to recreate it. How do you then leverage those kinds of things to scale? And it's more than just technology, it's processes, it's people. Um, you've got to fix those kinds of things also. Where are the easy steps to begin as opposed to the more challenging ones? Because if you take the more challenging ones first, you may work a lifetime to fix something and do nothing. How do we engage more than just a university? How do we engage more than that? How do we engage a system of those kinds of things? Could we go across systems? What kind of policy barriers are in place in terms of our two systems working together, as an example. Uh, what can we share? What can't we share? Uh, what happens to student data? I think something that's not been mentioned here yet, but I think is a huge area for all of us to explore, is we have things about FERPA, we have things about HIPAA. As we start getting more learning science data from mouse click stream data to other kinds of interactions that we have as individuals with learning environments, formal and informal, when that starts to get aggregated together, what's the data privacy that we want around that information? Because if my employer finds out that I have a strength or a weakness and we all have them, could it be exploited either for or against me? Who should have access to it? Even with the clickstream data, should we be using that for advising purposes? Do we need to get the student's permission to use it before we use it for advising purposes? There are realms here about data and the collection and use of data that nobody that I'm aware of is talking about or touching yet. And I think it's a huge area that we need to figure out. And then what components should be in those kinds of systems that are sharing that data? and using that data. As we get more AI agents using that data, um, as I talked about bias before, we certainly uh, would like to promulgate some things, but probably not all things, uh, in those kinds of systems. And how do we know when to and when not to? So there's huge opportunities here. I, I don't want to sound like I'm um, down on this. I'm excited every day because sitting in front of us in your capable hands is the ability to reshape higher ed for the next hundred years. We have that opportunity together and never in my lifetime have I seen that capability inside higher ed to be able to fix itself and to really solve some of the world's greatest challenges. And you're the experts. How can we enable you to make that happen? 
So on this worksheet are some of the themes and questions around the three parts of our presentation. And we also listed here uh, in the first uh, two columns whether you thought that might be something, again back to this question, where are the assets and what are they? Is it something that you should be doing institutionally or is it something that you sh could be doing as a system to leverage your strengths? I would add another column to this when we were talking about it at breakfast this morning. Your answer is important, but your rationale for why is even more important. Because those insights will help shape all of our thinking to try to figure out why did you answer what you answered and how do we find solutions together. There is no entity that I'm aware of that has an infinite budget. So how can we prioritize collectively together to solve these kinds of challenges for the benefit of those individuals that we're helping learn and be able to succeed in life tomorrow and do that today. So with that, happy to entertain any of your questions. Use this, give us some feedback also. I would love to hear your thoughts. What questions did we miss on this worksheet? You know, what was top of mind for you that's not here? What things seem redundant? Uh, because this has changed every time we've done this workshop uh, and it will continue to change. Uh, so uh, I, I, I told somebody yesterday, Yakut, you didn't hear this, but you will now, uh, that I think when we do the fourth one we need to give out an award because we have had a handful of people that have been to every symposium and they've told us, oh wow, I w didn't even think about that one the first time I came here. Uh, and so we continue to learn and we continue to share and, and it's our uh, position that we need to be sharing because that's what higher education does as a public good for everybody. So we look forward to your feedback too. Thanks Nelson. Do we want to uh, take a few minutes? Anybody have comments or other questions that you want to ask? And I'm not looking at the slide also Yakut. I don't know if there's anything in there. So I have one kind of about organizational structure. It sounds like sometimes you work with the offices outside of yours, maybe procurement and I don't know, marketing. Can you talk just a little bit about what do you do in-house, like in your department that you kind of have control over, and then what do you reach out and work with your campus partners on? Great question. I'm constantly reminded since earlier this week I also presented my budget uh, that I'm responsible for nothing. I'm just a steward of their money. Uh, <laughs> but w with that said, uh, very much tongue in cheek, uh, we're trying to build capabilities where we don't see them already existing at the institution level. And some of those are duplicate. Uh, for example, I have a registrar just like the, the rest of the university has a registrar, but our registrar does non-credit because this university's registrar only does credit. So I needed to build that capability to have that happen. I would love if we had one registrar that handled all learner registrations. I'm not there yet. Uh, I'm an advocate for it, but we're not there yet. Uh, I've built a market research team because I didn't see that capability in-house. We were part of some consortia early on uh, where we tried to uh, partner and outsource some of those kinds of things and quite frankly uh, again, this was early on in those days. Some of the studies I could have had an undergraduate student in my institution do a better job on the market study than, than I was given. Uh, so we built it in-house. Uh, and I think we have to keep trying those kinds of things. While I go back outside of house, we are using some outside experts for capacity. I can only build so many things in-house. It's kind of like I, my office sits over the interstate connector in downtown Atlanta and I can look out uh, most times of the day and it's just like a parking lot. Uh, but there's other times of the day where you can drive down it very freely. You know, how big do we build the interstate? So where are we going to build things in our own systems for the capacities in which we have to serve? And that's part of the student services conversation that we're having. The student services one, there's a lot of great places across the institute and I really think it's going to be a reimagining of how those folks work together and share information as opposed to building something uniquely in any one entity. Uh, at the Institute because that would best scale to, to everybody. Used to be back 40 years ago all of this uh, technology to do distance education was hugely expensive and you almost had to have a centralized way to do it because nobody could afford it. 
Uh, in today's world, most of us are carrying a technology, again, in our purse or our belt uh, that can do more than an adequate job if you have a good microphone and some decent lighting uh, to, to make these kinds of technologies come alive. So back in my early days with my NSF career award, I was looking at intelligent tutors and it was taking me 5,000 person hours per hour of class development. We're now down to less than 50. So the abilities that we have in terms of technologies to allow us to do things more efficiently, we need to constantly be looking at. So uh, I'm trying to find ways to move Georgia Tech forward, not just my organization forward, but I know that the university doesn't serve everybody I serve, so I have to build some things myself. I'd love for the rest of the university to pick it up. Uh, and take some of those things forward because they too then will learn who it is that we're serving. I hope that answers. Yeah, I was wondering if you can talk about um, how you measure success beyond enrollments. I know you have a really robust research arm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what kind of impacts you're looking at. And so one of the things that we're doing is we have what's called an education innovation ecosystem. Uh, something the provost has put in place because we realize we need to tell our stories and we need to move quicker and scale some things even internally. So uh, Georgia Tech professional education is somewhat the operational arm as its main stay in terms of uh, providing the services for the things that you've heard about here. Uh, but we have a think tank group called the Center for 21st Century Universities. Uh, and they're a collection of people across our institute that pull all of us together. What are we hearing? What are we seeing? What should we be researching as faculty? How do we jointly go after grants together? How do we even research across our own enrollments? So I share an associate dean for research with that group to actually look across our programs and what are learners of today actually thinking about so that as I build the operational aspects for tomorrow, I have that research insight uh, to make it look uh, how it needs to. Uh, it also includes our Center for Teaching and Learning. Because how do we take the information we're learning across a fairly small group of faculty that are doing these programs and scale it to the rest of the university faculty? Uh, and then fourth is our Office of Information Technology because as you've heard, technology is a big part of making all these things work. So how do I help that office and how can they help us plan for the future uh, as we go forward rather than be surprised, oh, there's going to be a new LMS next week, really? Uh, and, and begin those conversations earlier. Uh, as we do those kinds of things. And they bring things to the table too that they hear. Uh, and that collection of folks meeting monthly to share that kind of information is part of, of what we do. I would point you to our impact report though that's on our webpage of some of the things that we're looking at. And so it's easy, so I'm gonna put this in the context of evaluating a faculty member, it's easy to count papers and dollars in terms of research revenue. But is that the real impact? And so when I look at economic impact, that six to one ratio and those kinds of things, those are the things I'm focused on. It's a student story. I got one last night where we've had a student uh, successfully go through three different non-credit programs, uh, including the last one being a, a coding boot camp that we run and was just accepted into the Master of Science program and just doubled their salary in a new job in cybersecurity. Those are the kinds of things that make my heart warm. Last one that I'll just share with you is I do the commencement exercises for our non-credit programs when I can. And it's about four months ago, so it was just before Thanksgiving this past year, doing one of these activities. And an uh, individual walked up to me, family in tow, and said to me, you will never have an idea of how you touched and changed my life. And I said, could you explain? And they went on to say that their spouse dropped out, is now going back to school because of their experience. And alongside them was their 10-year-old daughter who didn't see a need for education and now has changed. How are we changing society forward? For everything else, there's MasterCard. <laughs> I, I have... Um uh, one last question. Um, uh, so Nelson, you talked about um, 
think I saw a Salesforce up on your slide. Um, is that your CRM that you're using? That's what we're starting to build out in, yes. Yeah. So, you know, we, we um, are just rolling out um, a CRM to a good number of our campuses and implementing um, our second CRM at the system level. Um, we also have um, many of our campuses using an early alert system. Uh, many of them Starfish, but there's some others out there as well. So could you talk a little bit about the, um, how you're thinking about you know, that side of the technology platform um, in terms of the relationship and the connection with the learners and you know, kind of, you know, we had an interesting conversation about that last night that I would just like you to touch on. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. And I think there are early days evolving, at least at our institution. I'd like to learn a lot more from all of you. Uh, but like most places, we have a student information system, Banner. Uh, there's lots of other ones that are out there, so I'm not espousing or ditching any of them. But they keep student information in terms of what courses you've taken, and they're used to audit to make sure that the credentials that we offer, or you, you've had the, the requisite uh, courses to do so. But that's not an educational experience. It's like saying good education is just watching videos. Uh, we need to be learning more about the people and what are the people wanting, what are their goals and aspirations in life, how can we help them do those kinds of things. So part of what's in this report, um, both in terms of whole person education but also in terms of lifetime advising, we think there's new forms of advising that have not yet been invented. How do you know if you're in a dead end job and your employer's not ever going to tell you but you know you've got a pink slip coming your way in 12 months, how can we help you prepare for that? Uh, so one of the ones that I often have conversations about right now, and it's the number one profession in most parts of the uh, world, including our country, is transportation services. Lots of people in that kind of an industry for lots of great reasons, and they're doing wonderful jobs. But automation is coming at them rapidly. How can we help retool them to be able to do something else before they get to those things? How do we change our own social policies so rather than just giving them pink slips and unemployment checks, maybe we retool them to actually service those robots or do something else in terms of reprogramming the robots or some other career field altogether. We need to be proactive in this and it's you in this room and your colleagues at your institutions that can make that happen and it's going to take an army of us to be able to do so. Uh, so our CRM is trying to find ways to build that relationship and if I had to say the long-term view it will supplant as our ERP our SIS and it will be the single source that we really want to know about as opposed to just the course um, grades uh, that, that one took because I would really like it to say hey you've been in this job for seven years it's stagnant how can we help you get out of it uh, you just got a promotion, how can we help you make sure you're successful? Those are the kinds of things as unbiased um, advocates for one's career path I think we in higher education can do rather than just build the careers to start and launch them and say bye, give us money next year please. Thank you. Please help me thank Nelson and Yakut. And, They're looking um, your way, Yakut. Yes. <laughs> um, this was really tremendous, Nelson. Thank you. And Yakut, thank you so much for, for the prep thank work you. and being here and, um, uh, and for helping to inspire us, I think. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of quick things before we let you all go. Um, as a reminder, um, next year um, we are scheduled to be in New York City um, at the Global Center. So um, put that on your um, calendar, although I don't know if we have the dates yet, but we'll get that out. Yep. Um, I want to just say um, a couple other thank yous. Um, I want to say thank you to the um, Center for Professional Development who does much of the um, event and organization planning and I don't know if any of them are in the room but I know Nancy is still outside so um, thank you to them. Um, also to the hotel staff who does a great job um, in, uh, um, with all of the setup and teardown and um, meals and everything. Thank you to Jeff for being here to, um, to um, capture everything and stream it. Thank you. 
and to those on the Georgia Tech side whom you can't oh, see yes, on the so screen. Yes, you can't see, yes. It takes a village. Um, thank you to the Twitter team who's been tweeting um, throughout the event. Um, and uh, thank you as well to the Open SUNY team. Uh, many of you are here. Um, some of you I know are watching um, remotely um, and a lot of work going into the planning and prep for this. Thanks um, especially to um, Alex, um, uh, who does uh, the main coordination of the agenda. Uh, Laura, our photographer, who is in the back. I did not um, forget you. Um, uh, so it takes um, a community to put this event on. Um, uh, everybody was so engaged. I think this was a really great three days. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. Um, but um, wish you all uh, safe travels home and, uh, uh, and a great weekend. Thank you.